Hi there, YouTube and makers, and thanks so much for joining me today. I'm glad to have you, and I really appreciate you spending your time with me. Today, I'm going to be tramming in this mill. And I admit, at first, I was really intimidated by this, and a little worried because I felt like if I got this wrong, somehow, I was going to end up permanently ruining everything, and the mill was never going to be good for the entire time I had it. But as I got into it, I realized that that is simply just not the case and that there's a lot of adjustment and there's a lot of corrections that can be done to get this thing dialed in perfectly. And it's something that's going to be reoccurring probably often throughout the use and life of this mill. So be sure to stay to the end because I'll be showing you some of the tips and tricks that I learned and figure out while tramming in this mill. So come on over here and join me at the bench. And let's tram this guy in. First thing I'm going to begin with is by checking out what the built-in error is in the machine. And it's kind of the first thing that Sherline wants me to do in the booklet to begin. And I'm just running it up and down the y-axis. And now I'm running it to the far ends of the x-axis. Y-axis is nice. I saw very little error on my indicator. The far end of the uh, table on the x-axis seem to have got about a thousandth of a run out but again it's at the far extent of the table so it doesn't seem too too bad act actually and i don't know if you've ever known how often i'm going to run it out like 17 inches from one to the other but um i think it's fairly acceptable and running it on the y-axis on the far extremes really got no run out at all and that was despite overloading the dial indicator and dropping it a little bit too hard in the t-slots so something to be conscious of so next i'm going to kind of see how much the saddle is off and as you can see it's really quite a bit so on one end it moves 15 thousandths and completely is off the table and if I bring it to the other end by rotating around it's gonna be pretty extreme and I'm running it basically I ended up maxing out the dial indicator so it's so the difference here in this tilt is over 30 thousandths Next thing I'm going to do is check the squareness of the saddle and Sherline wants me to use the uh, vise that's included in the A package which is absolutely perfect. Nice thing about it, it's got this little notch in the very middle which perfectly takes an indicator. In this step I'm not going to be too too concerned and worried about the alignment of the vise. And I'll just be very roughly getting the saddle bed perpendicular to, or parallel rather, to the x-axis of the table movement. And here you can see, just uh, checking out where it lies, is that it's dropping in a couple thousands, and then running it to the far extreme side. It's running about another seven thousand. That's almost ten thousands out of alignment. I'm gonna go ahead and loosen up the inner side of these two bolts holding the column. Man, this is a scary step because it just wants to dump over and slide everywhere. And really, it uh, would have been nice to have a second person to work with, but unfortunately, that wasn't available to me. So, I highly recommend getting the soliciting the help of someone here. Someone to hold the column and twist it while you tighten up the screws and keep it from dumping over. But just that little bit on my one molds himself, it uh, took out most of it. It's really only got a few thousands. So it took out a few thousands. Next, I'm going to take a page off of another machine and take the play out of the RAM. And as you can hear and see, it's got a fair bit amount of play. So what I'll be doing is I'll just line it up to the first set of numbers so it's not the, to the extreme one end or the other. 
and I'm gonna pinch the ram eventually in between my bicep and my chest and by applying pressure with either my bicep or chest I'm able to push and leverage the ram to one side to take up that play. And with the play taken up out of the ram as well as the column it really made this z-axis uh, saddle bed take up a lot of uh, play and it's run out as well underneath it looks like a thou. So I'm pretty happy with that. Next thing is I'm going to be using my machine squares. Uh, in my case I'll be using a, a mid Toyo that I recently got. And visually by using this piece of paper you can see that there is a bit of a gap. And again this is from the factory. That amount of uh, tilt that's on the saddle bed. And I'm very happy to report that as you can see it's on the opposite side that gap is on the opposite end so there isn't any kind of weird twisting going on here so I'm going to loosen up these four bolts on the face here to pivot it and it's a real process of developing the uh, right amount of tension or torque to leave on these bolts so that the saddle doesn't dump over and believe me it's going to dump over I thought I had enough tension on them and I barely tapped it and the whole thing flipped over uh, knocked over my camera and everything flailing around trying to catch it but luckily no harm no foul and I'll be using a uh, double sided hammer and in my case I'll be using the nylon side and I'll be tapping on the column bed to kind of take it up and my hands is there to support it because I'm a little bit traumatized from that flipping over but that light little wrapping is all that it took to get the column bed all nice and lined and parallel to the machine is square and it's nearly impossible to see through it at this point and even being up close and looking really close, I really couldn't see anything, so I'm happy with that level of alignment. Now I'm going to check the tilt of the column bed with the same machine as square, and I'll be doing it instead of in the middle on the edges where it's been machined. And just like with the column bed, you can see that there is a tad bit of a gap, and quite a bit, so even. So, but it is showing on the side that it is a bit off. And I'm going to begin by loosening the adjustment bolt here and taking the torque off. And then I'm going to be using it finger tight just to support it so that when I loosen the below flange nut, that it doesn't dump over or move anything too, too weird. And I want to leave just a tiny bit of tension left. I'm going to loosen it and then maybe do it hand tight maybe not much more than the weight of the wrench and just double checking and you can see that gap and by screwing it down it's going to tilt the saddle bed to the back of the machine and releasing tension it's going to release it forward so I'm going to unscrew it a little and it's going to drop that saddle bed forward and you can just see it disappear against the parallel so I'm happy with that these Machinist parallels work really, really well. I was really worried that it would be stacking tolerance against tolerance, but visually it's really nice to see it take up that play. Now, using my dial indicator, I'm going to check it again, and you can see I've gone from being well over 15 thousandths right now to just under 3 thousandths. So I'm pretty happy. I think I've roughly got it aligned and I'm content and ready to move on to do some fine tuning and dial this in. Just wanted to speak a little bit about adjusting the headstock in well as using the spacer. Sherline talks about taking out the play and tightening things up. And I do want to take out a play of this, but it is nice to have the spacer because it provides an additional dimension to twist or adjust the headstock to be more perpendicular to the bed. 
but the devil's in the details and each component like each of these keyways does stack tolerances on top of each other though i could use this to my advantage and twist the headstock to be more perpendicular and to work on this by myself what i did is i needed to get it loose but as you see too loose and it just drops away but i need it with enough tension on here to hold it up and for it to hold against itself and then i'll be able to take something like a soft-faced hammer and just lightly wrap against it and to take off that play but also to twist the headstock so it's nice and perpendicular to the plane of the mill table now once I've got my final position. I'm going to put a final heavy torque to lock it up and check these keys to make sure they pull out. Because what I found is if I don't take up the slack and there's not enough tension, those keys pull right out. So they're a good indicator. Personally, I would have preferred a second person to hold it like that and twist it in the direction I need. And the second person would tighten the screw. And as you can see with the back, the screw in the bottom of the bed the clamp will go right against it and I don't want to risk damaging it and and it protrudes so it's going to roll the clamp a little bit and the sides here just don't really have enough bite and they're real small space and I didn't really want to balance two sets of clamps and twisting the headstock and getting it lined up and tightening up the screw it just wasn't a practical solution here are some things that helped me for trimming in the mill. And this isn't anything that was specifically listed or discussed that I can recall in the Sherline manual, though it would have been really helpful. And I kind of figured these things out as I was trimming in my mill, but it's also based on my experience and a lot of advice that I'd gotten from people over the years. And one of the first things that I did to help myself out was to switch out hex keys. So instead of using the smaller Sherling hex keys, I went ahead and pulled mine out of my, uh, my set, which is a well-made, high-quality, American-made kit. And it is longer, and it provided me a little more sensi uh, sensitivity to feeling all the bolts, right? So that each one, as I loosened it, I could retighten it to about the same torque and second thing I did is in this crease here on my finger I put the hex key and kind of held it with my finger so that I could be a little bit more sensitive there's another youtuber named Keith Appleton he discusses in his channel a lot about British prototype steam locomotives and models and one of the things that he always mentions, is, well, not always mentions, but often mentions, is, is this concept of well calibrated eye. Well, effectively, it kind of doing the same sort of thing. I'm using a well calibrated torque wrench finger, I guess. That being said, I do own a torque wrench, and it is a quarter inch torque wrench that goes from oh, 30 to 200 inch pounds. And I could definitely use it to lo I loosen these four bolts, one, two, three, four, and torque them back into the same setting. But that kind of belabors the point, and that really drags things out, I feel like, to be a really, really tedious task. Having to torque each one, all four, every single time, in between each and every adjustment. Once I developed my well-calibrated torque wrench finger, I was able to more consistently tap over the saddle with the soft face of my hammer. Though even this introduced some issues and some errors. Initially, I was tapping at the very top on either side with varying amounts of force, and it was very inconsistency. I would get it over, still had a little more to go, and then it would be too much, then I would get it over, so it was this constant back and forth. To mitigate that, what I started doing is, I would use, found that I had a little bit more success 
in using the same amount of force, but changing where I was striking. So sometimes from to get it to move over more, I might strike up higher to get to move over a little bit less, maybe in the middle, and you get to move over the least down below. And I found that to be much more consistent. And that's something that really helped me, helped me out. And the last little tip and trick that I found when tramming in the saddle was to use a different, use a typical pattern for tightening the bolts that you would use on your an auto, automotive vehicle. Instead of doing all one side or whatever, I tried my best to crisscross. So I would torque this one down, then this one, then jump across, and finish up with this. And then once all four were done, I'd go over it a couple more times. So two more, so a total of three times, just to snug up everything to be more consistent. And once I started doing those three, th so three, three little things, it was a, it was a game changer. It was like night and day. It was very consistent. I could look at my dial indicator and say, okay, I'm going to strike it here with this amount of force, and I needed to move a couple thousandths, and it would do that. And it went really quick and really dialed it in well and help establish my confidence in my ability to tram this thing in. And these three tactics are something that are definitely going to come in handy quite immediately because I'm going to be basically having to do all this all over again when I tram in the tooling plate as well as get set up for machining the journal boxes. And this step I'm going to go ahead and check my final run out, my dial indicator and it's looking pretty good. Oh, I dropped in that T-slot a little hard. And unfortunately, that kind of hammers the dial indicator and causes it to slip a bit. But I'm gonna try to more carefully and gingerly bring it back onto the table. And try not to, but drop it too hard in that T-slot and keep bringing it around. I'm well within a thou run out. So tell me what you think, comment below. You think that's pretty good or what? But one thing I do want to say is I got to be careful about torquing the headstock. I'm not rotating it here. I'm just gripping the top of the headstock stock belt pulley wheel. And you can see it really fluctuates a lot. So that's something that's got to be really taken into account and be careful of so that error isn't introduced in. And the last step is that surely wants to make sure to check everything is aligned is to run a dial indicator up and down a machine square which you know about halfway here on my about a seven and a quarter inch tall uh, Meditoya machine square that I previously unboxed and so far less than a thou run out though some care needs to be taken because putting them using the machine square like this I'm stacking tolerance issues on top of tolerance issues and it's only so useful but run this guy all the way up to the very tippy top and still I'm only running less than that thou run off. So what do you think? Is that good enough? And the final thing, now that I've got my keys all tightened up and all the slack can't come out, I'm gonna make sure I have a way to mark them and know their orientation and which is which. And I'll be just using some permanent markers. I'm only using these two colors because these are the two colors that I had that weren't black. And I'm just going to color the end that sticks out, um, not all the way around, just the top and just one side. Uh, the side I picked is the side that fits in the key, the slot, so I'm going to just pick this side because it's the easiest to get to. And trying to get it on this back side is just such a pain. And I'm going to do the same thing but with blue on the other one so that I've got a good idea of which is which and make sure they don't get mixed up because here pretty quick I'm hopefully going to be adjusting this headstock and working on them journal boxes. Then last but not least is adjusting the zero. So when I have to go back to moving around let's say to 45 degrees here in a moment or something else in order to 
uh, cut the uh, journal boxes, when I gotta return it back to zero, I'll be able to do so hopefully fairly quickly. So let's loosen that. Ooh, tight from the factory. So let's try and get that perfectly lined up here. As perfect as I possibly can hope for. And then nice. Oop. And snug. Let's take a look. We did it. And that is it. That is a what I think is a pretty well trammed in mill. Let me know what you think. Do you think I got it in there good enough? I'm really excited and looking forward to using this machine to start making my first parts. Now, what I was kind of talking about how this is going to be reoccurring over and over again is that the moment I'm going to put on the tooling plate or I'm going to adjust the headstock at an angle in order to, in the very first part, machine journal boxes, and then the very next tooling, which is a bending jig for the tender wheel frames, is I'm gonna to have to adjust it all back nice, true, and square. So it's just gonna be something that happens quite often. And it's probably gonna happen every time I probably do a new setup. Something else that I wish I had done differently is I wish I had went ahead and already mounted this mill to a uh, the base or a plate to attach it to. It probably would have made it a little bit sturdier, not quite so flippy floppy, and probably would have made adjustment a little bit finer and not so uh, idiosyncratic. But having said that, after having to adjust this column around and mess with that, I realize that it is absolutely imperative that whatever I mount this mill to, whatever base I use, it's going to have to have access screw holes to access the screws that attach to the column. Because that thing's going to need to be checked, and that thing's going to be need to be retightened periodically, and that thing's going to need to be um, twisted and have the play taken out of in order to get everything nice and square. Now, it is time to make some chips on this mill, and I can't wait to share that with you. And so that you don't miss out on that, be sure to hit that subscribe button as well as the bell notification so that when those videos post, you don't miss it. Until next time, thanks so much for spending your time with me. But stay safe, have fun out there, and keep making chips.